the Patents on Translated video series, in association with Shine. How to get a patent granted at the Patent Office. In this video, I'm going to show the process you have to go through when you go through the Patent Office and actually get a patent granted. A lot of startup inventors, when they start out, know that they want a patent, but don't necessarily know how the process works. I've had at this point of making this video around 30 or more patents that I've, uh, patent applications that I've drafted, filed and prosecuted to patent, mostly at the UK Patent Office, but also some at the USPTO. So I'm going to take you through the process as it will happen. So step one is drafting a non-provisional patent application. A provisional patent application will never in and of itself ever be searched and examined at the patent office, therefore can never in and of itself ever become a patent. So it has to be what's often called a non-provisional, that's a term often used in the US, but I guess you could just call it a full application for search and examination. And that's the key thing, it ultimately has to be searched and examined by an examiner at a, pat at a patent office in order to become a granted patent. So that's the first thing that needs to happen. Second is filing of the non-provisional patent application at a patent office. In general terms, I will need to file a full application for search and examination at every single individual patent office that I want to get a patent at. So if I want a US patent, I'm going to have to file at the US PTO. If I want a UK patent, ultimately I'm going to have to file at the UK uh, or the IPO as it's called in the UK. There's a couple of minor exceptions. So uh, filing for European patent protection, I can file at the EPO, the European Patent Office, and do what's called designating of different patent offices. But as a general rule, I will have to file a patent application at each and every patent office that I want to get a patent at. There's no such thing as a world patent. So I have to file at each territory or patent office as a general rule. The next step is that I'm going to be waiting in a queue. So at a lot of patent offices, when I file, let's say the USPTO, if I file a non-provisional patent application, as a general rule, I'm probably going to be waiting anywhere from two to three years in the queue before my application actually gets searched and examined. And that's not because it takes a long time to search and examine. So for example, I know that UK patent office examiners tend to only take around six to eight hours to do the full search for a non-provisional patent application. The reason it takes so long is because there's a queue, there's such a long wait, especially at a patent office like the USPTO. So as I said, um, uh, two to three years at the USPTO, I've actually had one where I didn't get the search and examination results for more than three years. However, there are some patent offices that are very quick. For example, at the UK patent office, um, the UK IPO, I can request uh, accelerated search and examination free of charge. And that will mean if it gets accepted that I get my patent office search and examination results in around eight weeks or less. And I've actually had one come back in 18 days from the date we filed. And that's the basis of the Lightspeed Perfect Patent Service at step four of the inventor's journey. So if you want to get your official patent office results from one of the top patent offices in the world very, very quickly, as quick as 18 days, then uh, take a look into the Lightspeed Perfect Patent Service. We'll include links for that below. So next, an examiner is going to be apportioned to my application. This is another key piece of information to know. A singular, a single examiner gets apportioned to my non-provisional patent application to search and examine it. They may have supervisors, especially if they're slightly more junior examiners. It depends how the patent office works, but it will be one examiner which ultimately is apportioned to the non-provisional patent application to search and examine it. The next step which as we said, can come back in, depending what patent office you file, uh, can come back at different times, very quick or, or quite slow in some cases. But the next big step is actually getting the results back. So getting the search and examination results. In some patent offices, some people do file just for the search results initially. Um, I usually file for the search and examination because I can get that done so quickly, uh, filing first at the UK patent office. I normally go for full search and examination and uh, we get the results back very quickly. Like I said, this is the key step of actually getting the results. This is when the examiner will make a decision and will look at what, what I've claimed in, in the patent application, what's been claimed ultimately in the non-provisional and decide whether it's uh, whether it's good to go or whether there's, whether there's things which block it. This is often called the first office action because it's the first action that comes back in a substantive examination sense, I guess you could say, or really talking about the examination results. It's the first one that comes back to you. It's often sent through the post, although it can sometimes be done in other ways. So that's called the first office action. That's the key moment of actually getting the results. 
Now, once the results come through, one of a couple of things could happen generally. Um, the, the first key thing that could happen is your your patent application could be allowed. It could be deemed patentable by the examiner. So they might deem that there's nothing else in the world uh, as defined in your in your main claim or claims. There's nothing else in the world that that shows those things and that, that your application is pretty much good to go, in which case it may be allowed. And some patent officers, even if the claims are allowed, there might be some minor amendments which have to be done. For example, even to the the body of the description, there might be some things which the examiner doesn't like or wants amended, or just that just generally need to be amended for reasons I won't go into now. Uh, and some other patent offices, like the USPTO, uh, you might uh, need to pay an issue fee if it's going to go to grant. There's there's an issue fee at the USPTO, fairly minor at time of speaking right now. Uh, for small entity status, it's four hundred and eighty dollars. I think mine just gone up to five hundred actually. Um, and for micro entity status, it would be half of that, so around two hundred and forty or two hundred and fifty dollars. So not that much. Some patent offices, you don't even have to pay any issue fee. It can just go straight through. So that's one thing which might happen. But just pulling it back for a second, that's not normally what happens. That does happen, uh, but it's not necessarily the normal. Normally, the examiner will find something. They will find uh, a problem. So in, in that case, the next step would be prior art is found by the examiner. In other words, they find something out there, an invention or a disclosure somewhere, uh, and they they deem that it, what they would say, reads on the claims. In other words, whatever you've claimed for patent, they deem this thing blocks it, or at least blocks the, the main claim. And what they do at this point is they do basically a claim-by-claim claim analysis. So if you don't know what claims are, this won't make much sense, but there's a lot of videos that you might see at Shine Enterprise, um, so so please feel free to check out the inventorsjourney.com and you'll see a lot of videos about claims, which are the most important thing in terms of defining the invention in a non-provisional. So they'll do a claim by claim uh, analysis. So let's say with Spoon, we might have a main claim which generally says something like uh, a kitchen utensil device comprising uh, a head, uh, a handle, um, and at least one openable and closable hole in the head, something like this. And they might find something out there in the world which shows that. But we might also have what's called a dependent claim, let's say claim two, which says wherein the kitchen utensil device comprises a user means on a top side of the handle to facilitate opening and closing the at least one openable and closable hole, something like that. So basically this user mean, you can, you can see with the, the little arrow pointing to it now. And that would be uh, a claim we've got in there just in case the broad claim isn't allowed. We're also going to try to patent that in case that's new. So let's say the examiner might find that that uh, the main claim is not allowable, but they might find that our claim pointing to that user means to, or defining that user means on the top side of the handle, they might find that the prior they found doesn't show that feature and they consider that inventive, in which case we can't get broad patent protection for any openable and closable whole kitchen utensil device or spoon, but we can get patent protection for it when we also have that special user means, something on the top to help open and close it. And that could still be a very powerful patent if I deem or I think or, or in reality that feature makes a better product or a more commercially viable product. Obviously, there is a worst case scenario here where it might just be that prior art is found which rules out absolutely everything. Um, and that's rare in my experience. It's not happened to me very many times at all, but it potentially could happen. That's one of the reasons as step one in the inventor's journey, we do the elite perfect patent search, which kind of like the way the patent office search here works is a claim by claim search. So you'll get feedback, not just on the main concept, but also on the next most important, potentially uh, the next most important features. Um, and that's why it's very important to do an elite, you know, a very good search before you file at the patent office. Otherwise, all this time could be wasted, a lot of money, time expense, if it just comes back blanket, kind of not patentable. So if priority is found, let's take that example where the user means on the top side of the handle is deemed patentable. What will happen then is I have to amend my claims. And so what I might do is I might bring that feature of the user means on the top side of the handle and bring it into the main claim to therefore get the, the claim allowed. And that's a simple situation where we're just gonna bring a feature from a claim. It's not always that simple. I might not necessarily bring a feature in from a claim. I might look at the prior art, and this is where a lot of, you need to have a patent practitioner who's very skilled and sometimes has a little bit, at least a little bit of creativity in finding the best way through. So I might look at the prior art and I might see what the prior art shows and the way it's blocking my, my, my claim for patent. And I might then slightly amend the claim, not necessarily bring in a feature from the other claims, but slightly amend it to just get past, just get kind of eliminate the prior art that the examiner's found and still get the broadest patent protection possible. So there's a bit of an art form to this. There's a bit of creativity required, a little bit of creativity, quite a lot of skill and definitely precision. Because if I 
say if I define the invention in the wrong way and I over limit it by mistake, I could make the patent effectively pretty much useless if I if I do that wrong. So that's an example. And what I will do uh, when I make those amendments, I will ultimately file those. So uh, usually this will mean me filing online, filing my amendments with a little covering letter explaining the amendments, this type of thing, and arguments, notes, whatever it may be. Hopefully the examiner will allow that, will, will agree with those amendments and will allow those amendments. If not, we go through a kind of rinse, wash, repeat situation where this this process of the, exam, the examiner might then not allow the amendments again. And this happens quite a lot. That It might just not be still. It might not get through all the prior art. They, they might even look at other prior art, whatever it may be, in which case they're going to, again, uh, say that it's blocked. It's, it's, it's not getting through. It's not allowed, in which case I'll have to amend again. There are some patent offices where you only get a certain amount of amendments you can do, a certain number. So at the USPTO, for example, I get one normal round of amendments uh, and then so the examiner will come back and let's say it says, it says that the, uh, the the claims are blocked and I'll get one round of amendments and then the examiner will come back with, with what's called a final rejection. In reality, it does not necessarily mean a final rejection. And there's actually a new pilot scheme at the USPTO where provided I don't do, provided I stay within the same scope of what the claims were, I can actually do another, a second round of amendments without having to pay any extra fees. But if that wasn't the case and I needed to go through a much more examination, uh, I, I think I would have to pay a, a patent office like the USPTO extra fees and kind of further examination. Um, at, at some patent offices like the UK, it's up to the examiner how long it can go on. But as, as long as you keep on showing clear desire to get the patent granted and moving forward, in my experience, UK in the UK patent office, you will not get charged for any extra uh, examination. I've, I've gone through in some cases four or five rounds and not been charged any extra. So generally, we're going to go through a rinse, wash, repeat situation there, hopefully until we get the claims allowed. Now, it's possible there might not be a way through, but let's imagine there is a way through and I end up uh, amending in such a way that the examiner is happy. That will mean that the next step, again, like we said earlier, which could happen at the, the first time of speaking, the examiner will deem the claims allowable. And... Uh, this, in some patent offices, this effectively means the patent's been granted. But like I said, there are some patent offices like the UK, for example, if the claims have been allowed after various amendments, this will mean that the definition in the claim is slightly different from how I've disclosed the invention in the body of the specification. And although this is a bit complex going into this, what I have to do is do amendments to the, the specifications, so things like the written description, and I have to amend it in such a way that it's clear now what is being claimed and what is not, because my definition has changed, maybe become more limited, because now, now remember I'm I'm patenting the kitchen utensil device when it has that user means on the top side of the handle, not just the broad concept. So in the UK, I would have to make that clear in the specification. In some patent offices, I don't have to make that amendment. It can just go through to grant. But like I said, there are some patent offices like the USPTO where we'll have to pay an issue fee. So for example, like I said, about $480 at the time of speaking, around $500, or my currency status around $240 to $250 to get that issued as a patent. So that takes you through the, the general process of how to get a patent granted at the patent office. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you want to find out anything else, for example, how to maintain uh, your patent once it's granted, let's say how to pay patent maintenance fees at various different patent offices, um, please feel free to check out the rest of the Patents Untranslated video series or the link you see in this video underneath. And if you want to check out the rest of the Patents Untranslated video series and get access to it, and also get access to the elite steps and services of the inventor's journey, including the Elite Perfect Patent Search, which replicates an official patent office search, and the Lightspeed Perfect Patent Service, which can get you official patent office feedback from one of the top patent offices in the world in as quick as 18 days, please become a crew member aboard Shine Enterprise, and you can do that by checking out theinventorsjourney.com.